Good morning. Welcome to the BYU Marriott Real Estate Webinar Series. My name is Barrett Slade, the host of today's webinar. We hope all of you are well today. We want to report that uh, one of our resorts here in Utah now has reached over 700 inches. For those of you doing the calculations, that's 58 feet of snow. So it's been a phenomenal winter. If you haven't got your skiing in yet and you're out of state or out of the country, there's still lots of snow left, and uh, we hope that you'll come out and see us sometime. Anyway, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to announce that on April 20th, Brandon Blazer, founder and president of BCG Holdings, will be our webinar presenter, and he'll be talking about development in opportunity zones and urban redevelopment in general, and given the current environment, uh, it should be a very interesting webinar, so we'll be sending out an invitation to that webinar in the near future. Uh, we invite those of you who are on the call to uh, ask questions. We love your, your questions. Uh, just hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type those in, and we'll get to those as time permits. So uh, today we have with us Mr. Andrew Ord with Graystar. He's uh, managing director over the Build for Rent single family development platform. And Andrew, it's so great to have you with us today. Welcome to the to our webinar. Uh, how are things in Dallas? Things are great, Barrett. Great to be with you as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm excited um, to talk to everybody today, and even more excited to kind of go before Brandon Blazer. I, I wouldn't want to follow his act um, <laughs> next month. So oh, appreciate it. it. You both would be great. Well, why don't you go ahead and proceed and tell us uh, a little bit about uh, yourself and your your uh, your journey in your career so far with Graystar and and also of course uh, teach us about the build for rent uh, market and environment. Awesome. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, Barrett. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, great. I'll jump right in. Uh, again, appreciate so much the the time and the opportunity. Um, this is uh, super excited for me. Um, to, to one, you know, everybody likes to talk about themselves. I'll try not to go too long on that, but hopefully it'll be additive and beneficial to, to those that may, uh, may care. Um, and then I'll get into the bill for rent single family, you know, rental strategy and, and here at Graystar and kind of how we're approaching that new and exciting space. It truly is new and exciting. I mean, in a very literal sense, we're, we're just, we're feeling our way through it, trying to learn it. Um, there's a lot of wood to chop, um, going forward and, uh, it'll be fun, but, um, thought I'd first kind of, you know, out of the gate, just direct my comments um, to the students. I know I'll talk to the students a little bit at the end of the presentation as well, but, um, you know, as they kind of work their way and feel their way, feel their way through um, their career aspirations and, um, you know, where they want to set up shop, um, thought I'd explain a little bit about my background and, and try not to sugarcoat it, you know. I mean, um, I heard a quote the other day that said, uh, life is a tragedy tainted by malevolence. Um, and that's, although it's pretty harsh, harsh way to describe life. I think we see things a little bit differently, but, um, you know, life is hard and it, it requires, um, kind of a center of mass forward, uh, type, uh, approach. And so I grew up in Southern California, uh, one of four brothers. So we were five boys. Um, my father was a real estate developer in Southern California. He was, um, one of those, you know, kind of um, quintessential kind of stereotypical real estate developer, you know, kind of got out there and, and, and really um, um, put himself out there and, and risked a lot and 
um, taught us boys, you know, how to how to just kind of go for it type thing. Um, and he was larger than life to, to all of us. Um, but one thing he wasn't above uh, was were the real estate cycles, right? And and we saw those come and go in Southern California growing up. So my career started, you know, back when I was a little boy, kind of watching my my father navigate those real estate cycles. And um, and uh, and my story is, is kind of riddled with, um, you know, downturns and uh, reinventing myself. So as I observed my dad early on in my life um, and as he navigated, I just saw, you know, the peaks and valleys of a uh, Southern California developer and uh, and kind of thought to myself, man, I, I don't know if I want to do that for a living. Maybe I want something a little more stable, uh, but I guess I had it in my blood um, such that when I graduated from BYU, I, I went to work uh, for him um, at, at his company. And I saw it as a unique opportunity, right, to to be with my dad and know how much longer I'd, I'd, you know, be able to spend time with him here on this earth. I, at the time, I guess I had about, you know, 20, 15 more years, it turns out. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity that I had to kind of learn from him. And, um, but uh, as was the case, you know, 2008 hit and the world changed and, um, and we were affected uh, pretty substantially. And so I was faced with the decision, um, to, to kind of reinvent myself and, and kind of figure out, you know, how I wanted to approach the rest of my career. Uh, decided from there to, um, to head back to Dallas, Texas, where my wife is from, and, uh, and enter business school at, at Southern Methodist University. Um, very grateful for SMU and, um, and their impact on, on kind of our life as a family and, and the Dallas area, which is very, very, very good to us. Um, so, um, you know, came, it realized very quickly that Dallas had a, a very strong, deep uh, real estate culture um, and was, you know, fraught with opportunities and knew that I wanted to, uh, you know, hitch my wagon to a company that maybe had the ability to weather cycles and started looking at companies like the Irvine Company or, or you know, where I ended up Graystar and, and their, the model, which was, you know, kind of a, a management backbone with some opportunistic um, kind of legs to the stool in the form of development and, and acquisitions uh, with the requisite kind of support services around that, that operating model. And um, interned with Graystar uh, when I was at, uh, at, at SMU and came out and ended up going back to Charleston where, where our headquarters is based and worked for Bob Faith and Bill Maddox as their chief of staff. And so got to know kind of the, the culture and, um, all the wonderful people back there and, and learned very quickly that Graystar was, you know, a very entrepreneurial company that had um, and hired wonderful, wonderful people that have, have continued to kind of bless my life. So I would just maybe pause there and say, as, as you guys look forward to, um, you know, future opportunities, you know, think hard about the people that you're going to be working with. And, um, you know, it's been said that we're kind of the, the, the average of the six people we spend the most time with in our lives. And, and, um, and I've had the opportunity to rush shoulders with a lot of wonderful people here at Graystar that hopefully have um, influenced, you know, um, and made me a better person from that standpoint. From there, fast forward, I've been here in Dallas for about 10 years now, or about 11 years, 10 years of which were focused on uh, real estate development, specifically, obviously, in the in the apartment sector, uh, with with some retail and mixed use projects mixed into there. But in that 10 year period, um, we developed about gosh 36, 37 deals, um, almost over 10,000 units, um, roughly gosh 8,500 of those, give or take. Um, I kind of directly kind of worked on and participated in in um, and so it's been a great ride of, and a lot of volume and a lot of reps. That's the other thing I would probably kind of urge everyone to, to angle towards is try to get as many reps as you can, um, especially early, early in your career. You know, that will shape you and, and help you develop that kind of the judgment uh, that you need going forward. And so um, is, I guess it was a little bit over a year ago, um, officially June of, or September of last year that I... Uh, that I started kind of getting, you know, toe dipping into this BFR single family space. Um, and that would be kind of the third thing that I'd like want to you know, communicate to the students out there is make sure that you're always kind of growing. You know, I think um, kind of that whole idea of center of mass forward, you know, we don't want to be back on our heels. We don't want to be flat footed in life. We want to be center of mass forward. And 
um, and center of mass forward implies that we're we're learning and we're seeking new opportunities and and looking for new trends and you know a, a whole new runway that could maybe propel our career forward. So um, hope I chose right and in the form of VFR. And uh, I'd like to kind of walk you through uh, some of that thesis going forward. I'll try to be try to be thoughtful at time here. So real quick, just um, to those that don't know, uh, Graystar has become a, a large company. Um, we uh, we're in um, almost 227 markets globally, and and um, take part in almost 250 billion dollars worth of um, real estate worldwide. Um, we have a deep local experience uh, with a heavy concentration um, in in the U.S. I think. From the beginning, um, Bob Faith has really tried. He, he understands that real estate is a is a very local business, and it requires you know local talent and local you know experience, and people that understand those markets. And so we're we're deep into those local markets, and we understand them um, in that respect. This is just kind of a fun slide that I'll 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 pass over pretty quickly. But um, one of the the biggest thing I, I love on this slide is that we manage almost 800,000 units, uh, which provides kind of the bedrock to how we invest and develop. So that was the thing that caught my eye with Graystar early on is just the, the breadth of, of units that they manage, which, which really help us to um, invest and develop um, in a real smart, uh, you know, strategic way. And contrasting to those 800,000 units, we manage just about 8,000 units of BFR. So we're very early on in that um, that process, that evolution. Um, it is our hope that it, that space will continue to grow um, and, and develop. So we're just trying to grow the platform every day and, and get brighter and tighter in, in how we approach uh, this space. It's uh, it's becoming more and more institutionalized, um, getting a, li a little bit more of a groove, trying to understand the investment dynamics and what makes sense um, from an institutional standpoint, um, and that that always takes time. But you know, we we think hard about obviously you know location that's big in in, in real estate. Um, excuse me. Uh, we you know we we look hard at schools, um, commute score, um, household incomes. Um, that's that's one of the key things that um, drives this asset class. I think is uh, you know schools, quality of schools. You know how far out you've with how far are, out are you with regard to commute times, and you know what what is your affordability kind of tell you that, that you can charge rents at um, product type. We target uh, at Graystar. Um, we've chosen to kind of target more of the single family products such as detached homes and, and townhomes. You know, huge hats off to um, groups like Christopher Todd and Next Metro, whom have done an incredible job with the horizontal uh, apartment space. And uh, we'll probably continue to kind of get into other product types as well, but they've done a phenomenal job. And for those of you that don't know, the horizontal, you know, kind of cottage product is surface parked, detached single family homes um, that uh, feel a little bit more apartment like given they're not in a traditional kind of single family neighborhood setting. Uh, but and those groups have done a phenomenal job at getting kind of getting in and creating scale early and uh, figuring out that space. Um, our product mix is primarily three and four bedrooms. Um, I think it's important to know that 60, 65 percent of single family rental homes are are three bedrooms, contrasting to 11 percent of uh, apartments are typically three bedrooms. So already you can kind of start to see the, the vacuum that's being created in the market with regard to larger format housing options uh, for people across the country, especially when you contrast that with what we call kind of, or what I've heard described as the first child, second dog cohort. Um, so this millennial generation um, age 35 to 50 that um, is in a very, very big way coursing you know, into the, um, kind of the Americana dynamic of, of housing necessity and um, residential need. Um, and that'll happen over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more as well. Uh, from an underwriting standpoint, you know, obviously we look hard at rent growth, uh, which is definitely a question in all of our minds today. We believe that single family rental, you know, due to the imbalance of supply and demand will, um, will, will, will fare well in that 
um, in that arena as we, you know, potentially face down a maybe a third quarter, or fourth quarter, you know, recession. We'll see what happens, but um, you know, so rent growth, obviously rents. We tried to try to peg rents appropriately. Uh, there's not a whole lot of comps out there. There's not an apartment deal down the street that you know has proven the market already. You're looking, uh, you're looking hard at shadow inventory in the market. You know what Zillow and, and Redfin and you know those internet providers are are teeing up. What the mom and pops that own maybe one or two homes in, in the market are, are renting, or American Homes for Rent, or Invitation Homes, some of these other scattered site single family uh, rental providers are are, are doing. Um, and then we're, we look hard at obviously costs, you know, costs have, you know, thankfully been going our way lately as, as the Fed pushes hard on quantitative easing and um, the market starts to kind of slow a little bit. We're seeing benefits on the cost side as well, but um, it's, it's a whole new proposition for a company like Graystar to go build homes uh, versus, versus apartments. I think uh, we know that we can build apartments, uh, but the the sub base and uh, and how those are built are are totally different. So there's been a little bit, a little bit of a learning curve um, for us as we kind of figure out how to maybe one self perform those on our own or or, or partner with um, other large home builders across the country, regional and local builders to um, to build those for us. Um, we're tip we're currently working through relationships with a lot of the major home builders out there and trying to establish you know national relationships to. Um, to have them build homes for us as we kind of figure out our strategy. Um, and then, and then there's the operating um, side of things, you know, how, what does our operating model look like and, uh, and what's the level of service we want to provide. Um, Technology is helping a lot with that to lower operating costs, you know, as we, as we look at different sorts of prop tech, you know, digital locks and digital thermostats and digital garage, op garage door openers and, um, you know, um, kind of an enterprise software system that'll kind of help you manage um, the, the resident a little bit better. So we can talk a little bit more about that as well. So the market opportunity, um, there's there's roughly 126 million occupied housing units in the U.S. So um, 82 of those, 82 million are owned and 44 million are rented. So out of those 44 that are rented, um, 24 uh, million of those are um, single family rental units versus 19 million apartments. So you can see this is a very large space. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that it's, um, although it's large in, in opportunity uh, from an institutional standpoint and from a, uh, from a real estate investment standpoint, it's, it's actually pretty small. You know, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the Single family rentals are, you know, people that own one or two homes as as maybe an investment that they have on the side, uh, you know, not, you know, I guess not not so recent, you know, big companies like uh, Invitation Homes and American Home for Rents have done a phenomenal job at coming into that space and soaking up some of that institutional, um, you know, opportunity as well. And so, you know, where in the apartment space you see an institutional uh, ownership in the 33% range of all apartments in the single family home market, uh, bill for or F SFR market, you see about 3%. So you can see um, single family rental market is, is kind of tracking the trajectory, I get, albeit in the early days of what apartments were, you know, maybe back in the uh, 60s or 70s as they kind of became more accepted into the institutional realm of, of real estate investments. So, um, like I said, most institutional ownership is, is focused on the scattered site SFR. And I guess I should kind of, um, for those that might, might not know, um, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the acronyms and stuff we use in, in this industry are continuing to evolve. You know, SFR typically refers to kind of your scattered site um, real estate investment aggregators as they go out and buy one-off existing single, fa single family homes and, and rent them. And, and they've done a phenomenal job um, it, it made, made possible in large part by the wonderful technology systems that they've made a part of their business to manage desperate, you know, scattered uh, single family uh, rental opportunities uh, to, be, to be able to deliver a consistent level of customer service in a, in a very desperate, disparate kind of uh, um, format. Um, like I may have mentioned earlier, um, we're focused more just given our 
our DNA in the development space of um, of doing more of a purpose built, you know, kind of fully amenitized, professionally managed community that's all in one location, not dissimilar to uh, an apartment, you know, uh, community that you'd see in today's day and age. Uh, you know, in terms of who we're attracting in that space, talked a little bit about the millennials and uh, their impact on, on this generation. I should probably also touch on the um, 65 and older, the, uh, the baby boomers that are, um, you know, 10,000 are turning 65 each day. And a lot of them are deciding to, to maybe downside a size or, or, or move into a, a resident, residential option that's more lock and leave and more uh, maintenance uh, free or maintenance minimal. minimal. Uh, so they can enjoy, you know, just the, the, um, you know, the, those those golden retirement years as well. So I think you're getting demand from both 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 sides of, of the barbell, if you will, uh, not only millennials but the uh, the age restrict the the 65 and older uh, crowd as well. Uh, you know, I think one of the the down down payments uh, remain an ob obstacle for uh, or a financial hurdle. For um, you know, a lot that want to buy, you know, so it's forcing these uh, millennials to um, look, kind of look for other options, uh, given the given the dislocation in the housing market and the, the affordability crisis we have in, in the U.S. It's uh, really causing you know younger families to kind of rethink a little bit of how they you know maybe kick off uh, where, where they live um, as they um, as they think about buying you know it, itself. Uh, mortgage rates, you know, mortgage rates have obviously skyrocketed up um, and those in line with the affordability discussion, those that increase in mortgage rates has, has boxed out, um, you know, the figure I read was almost 18 million of households from qualifying for a $400,000 mortgage. So, um, yeah, pretty staggering when you think about that and just kind of the reality of the housing crisis and, and affordability shortage uh, in in the in the residential space today, um, we believe uh, rent growth will continue to remain resilient. Uh, well, I shouldn't be too bullish. Rent growth is is going to suffer. We've experienced you know a few years of you know, record rent growth. We feel like that's going to um, that's going to lower quite substantially. But um, we don't think it's going to get into the negatives. We think it's going to stay stay positive um, in in this space and continue to provide housing options for those that maybe are pushed out of home ownership. Um, you know, values have been affected as interest rates, or excuse me, as cap rates have, have blown out in the space as well. Um, but we think like values will be propped up, um, you know, somewhat due to the massive amounts of capital um, that are kind of waiting in the sidelines and are already in this space uh, to, to keep cap rates at a reasonable level. So, um, Overall, I think we're we're generally bullish on how, how we work our way through this, you know, these next couple of years. Um, in terms of more of the investment thesis, um, you know, due to demographic and secular shifts, um, they point towards a medium and long term increase in demand for large format rental rentals such as um, single family homes. Um, there's a obviously a, a rise in popularity overall in single family rental. But um, we believe that that rise in popularity will continue to kind of spill over into what will be purpose-built, uh, professionally managed, uh, fully amenitized uh, development um, developments um, versus um, the scattered site that you've seen a lot of up until today. Um, talked a little bit about the growing demand wave, that age cohort from age um, 35 to 50 as um, over the next, um, call it 10 to 11 years, will increase figures I've seen up to 20%. So almost 12 million new entrants into that age cohort, which will um, very much kind of buoy up the demand side of the equation when it comes to single family rental. Um, it's not until, you know, kind of, <laughs> as you look at kind of the demographics, it's not until 2035 or even 2040 where you start to see that maybe, or this graph here level off a little bit. Um, should probably also add that uh, student borrowers age um, 30 to 44 owe about 49% of the national student loan balance. So there's a lot of student debt out there that is also kind of affecting um, 
you know, home ownership affordability as well, which we feel like will continue to propel this thesis forward and really just provide another opportunity, another option uh, in, in the market that doesn't exist today. You know, I think of when I was uh, fresh out of school and how when Allison and I were trying to, you know, feel our way through life and, and had some kids in tow, you know, we moved to Houston, um, you know, initially right after Charleston with Graystar and we found a, a one-off single family home, but it was uh, an owner that was kind of, <laughs> could have sold out from underneath at any point. Luckily, they let us live there for a year before we had to move again. And, and, uh, and they sold the home and, and we had to kind of look, look elsewhere to find a house. So I think there would have been great comfort for a, a young family like ours to, um, you know, especially if we're parachuting into a market, not sure how long we're going to be there to have a, you know, a, a kind of a, a thoughtful um, development that's again, professionally managed and, and amenitized in a way that, you know, we as a family could plug into and have uh, you know, a little bit easier transition into an area. And so that's, we're really excited to kind of provide those opportunities um, to people that need them uh, across the country and really provide that next level experience. Uh, because as we know, time is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a precious commodity and life just seems, I don't know about everybody on the call or on the, the, the Zoom, but uh, life just continues to get more and more busy. So the more we can, um, you know, streamline and make our lives a little bit easier. And from a maintenance standpoint uh, and a residential living standpoint, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a healthy value proposition to um, those that, that need it. A little bit more about the growing demand wave. You can see here towards the end of this, this bar chart, um, you know, in, in blue there, you see new demand of housing and in, in the gray, uh, on the far right side of the graph, you see uh, new net new supply. So we kind of ch choked from a single family standpoint, we kind of choked the supply side. Uh, I think we were all kind of reeling. I know I was after the great financial crisis and trying to find our footing. And there was a very slow ramp up to kind of get homes back online. I think people were pretty jaded and um, weren't quite sure about um, you know, sticking their neck out and taking risks after what was, you know, one of the worst financial recessions of, of you know, of history. And so I think you have that kind of, <clears throat> that overhang of, of, of demand coming out of that you know, space and time. And then you, you layer that, you layer on top of that, the, the, the millennial and the 65 and older kind of dynamic and kind of those those huge you know demographic uh, dynamics that are pushing into the space, and you kind of have a perfect storm uh, of where we're at today. So there's definitely a um, housing shortage. Uh, I, I read an interesting stat the other day from MetLife. The MetLife Housing Report is based on um, they said that they believe around 80 percent of the new construction over the next decade will be single family homes versus 20 percent of apartments. So that maybe it gives you an idea, frames up uh, where where the demand is heading um, in the space. We'll see if that pans out. Uh, whereas I guess it, the, the most recent decade, 40% uh, was, um, there was 40% of apartments built versus 60% of, of new homes. So in the next decade, that, that dynamic will flip a little bit uh, in favor of single family homes um, if you're looking at the demographics and supply and demand. Dynam supply and demand. In terms of how we look at deal, let me just talk a little bit deal level here. Um, two more slides, and then we can kind of open it up for uh, for questions. I want to leave plenty of time for questions, uh, given this is such a, a new space, and there might be uh, those that are interested. Uh, from a deal screen standpoint, we, we look at a, a number of different factors. You know, we look at in, in any given area where we could look at homeowner you know ownership percentage in an area. We look at household income growth. You know, that's what is the trajectory of a, a certain area? You know, is there a good runway um, that we'll be able to kind of afford the rents that we we need to charge to uh, underwrite a deal appropriately for the markets? Um, home price growth. Uh, you know, the like we've talked about the 30 to 50 year old population growth, and wh where is that headed in a, in a given area? Uh, you know, our Graystar internal um, data 
you know, we have a lot of data that shows we can track, you know, as people move out of apartments, you know, what are some of the areas that they're, they're moving to? And, uh, and we can see that on a heat map and see concentrations of millennials as they, as they move to certain areas, you know, whether it be for, for schools or maybe they just need more space, you know, from a work from home standpoint, whatnot. Uh, we, we target, you know, psychographics. Uh, we target, we look hard at, at demographics. Again, um, household income, you know, what are, what's the rent to own? What, what's the rent to income in that, in that market? Uh, we need to we need to understand that our rents are you know, and, you know at a discount or actually in line with with home home ownership. One dynamic you're seeing um, in today's market is you know as you could all probably imagine is the disparity between you know what a mortgage payment is versus what what you can rent for, uh, and that as interest rates go up that um, that gap continues to widen. Um, this was months ago but at at, uh, at a certain point not too long ago and i'm sure it's it's kind of hovering around the same disparity you know the the cost to own was about 800 dollars more a month than the cost to rent uh, which is you know kind of a staggering uh value proposition and uh and so we want to be thoughtful about uh you know where our rent's coming in and that they don't um you know take any larger than their fair share of of, of, of the median income of the person that's renting. Uh, so um, we'll look at single family housing supply and we'll also look at liquidity in markets. I mean, this is a, a new space, uh, you know, in itself. And there's some markets, you know, albeit, you know, secondary and tertiary markets that just aren't that liquid, you know, institutional capital just hasn't gotten there yet uh, from an investment standpoint. And so we want to be mindful of, you know, to the degree there are trades, um, you know, how many trades are there and, and you know, are our institutions interested in, in these, you know, what, what we will we be first to market these primary markets and what does our exit look like, you know, from a liquidity standpoint in terms of selling these. So that's just a little bit about our, our buy box, kind of how we think about um, how we target developments in this space. From a design standpoint, uh, this is a, a picture of a site plan uh, of a deal that we have in uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, in specific Peoria. Summerwell is our uh, bill for rent branding uh, name, and uh, and that's the the brand that we're leading with across the country of all of our single family or our bill for rent product. And this is a deal that uh, many of you may know, Adam Klein. Um, him and his team in Arizona have been working feverishly putting together this deal. It's roughly about 240 homes. There's a few, they're all primarily detached. There are a few uh, um, duplexes in there, but they've worked diligently with the city of, of Peoria to create a really cool plan development uh, that in, in my mind, you know, kind of really optimizes what we're trying to bring to market. You know, so these are, Three and four bedroom homes in a in a very thoughtful uh, single family kind of development plan layout with you know parkways and, and green belts and you know good circulation uh, you know some of the key design dynamics that we're looking for in the space or just trying to hit you know as people move from apartments you know maybe downsize from a home or whatnot you know either way they still want a yard you know they want. That, that yard, again, first child, second dog kind of syndrome. They they want a, a, a yard that maybe they couldn't have in the apartment or maybe that they had in their single family home, but you know they're not ready to kind of fully get rid of. So trying to be thoughtful about a space where they could kind of get outside that's in a perfect world private. And then obviously, you know, direct access garages. These are um, key and definitely something you can't get in the apartment space today, typically, right? You can have tuck under garages and whatnot, but um, just kind of your, your very own direct access to car garage is key, we view in this space when it comes to customer preferences. Um, so, and then from a, from a prop tech standpoint as well, I'm trying to be thoughtful about how we think about that space. You know, we found that we can limit our employees on site um, as we kind of maximize um, property technology in, in that way. 
uh, or our clubs tend to be, um, whereas in a typical multifamily um, configuration, clubs will be anywhere from, you know, five to 7,000 square feet. You know, all the bells and whistles, kind of your typical uh, multifamily club uh, arms race in, in terms of amenities. And this is a little bit different, you know, that we view, at least at this stage in the game, that the amenities are more built into the home itself, you know, the larger format, you know, maybe you have a third bedroom, maybe you have an office that you didn't have in the multifamily space, uh, maybe, you know, you obviously have the yard, you have the direct access garage, you have, you know, maybe some more green space that you get out to. So trying to kind of commensurately size down the club to be a place where uh, people can go uh, for, you know, maintenance issues or just like a central hub of contact uh, for the community, but uh, not a place that they're really going to hang out, you know, based on the fact that they'll hopefully be spending more time in their homes. So uh, we try to include a pool wherever possible. Uh, fitness is sometimes hit and miss depending on, um, you know, what, what the project can bear and what we feel is necessary uh, for that particular deal. But uh, so trying to go a little bit minimal on just kind of the, um, the club and, and leasing office formatting from that standpoint. Uh, walkability is huge. So really try to incorporate, um, you know, where we can trails and of course, you know, a sidewalk network where people can kind of get out and um, enjoy the larger expanse of, of where they live um, versus what, what might have been a more uh, dense environment in a, in a multifamily setting. So um, talk a little bit about just the platting. I mean, this particular deal, this is a, a single plat. Uh, so the ownership isn't, isn't subdivided into individual lots. Uh, we like this approach a lot. Obviously cities are still kind of wrapping their mind around how um, to manage this from an ordinance standpoint. And uh, when you can get in with a city and develop trust with them and kind of work through, you know, a very thoughtful uh, PD plan development uh, with the city, uh, this is a great way to go. Uh, we've also approached it the other way, where it's, you know, your traditional single family neighborhood where you have individually platted lots and it feels much more like a traditional subdivision. You know, that's okay too. And, uh, and there's people that are going to want to rent in a, in a traditional single family subdivision, uh, but you lose a little flexibility in, in terms of density and, um, you know, being thoughtful about kind of the layout and, more of an apartment like like uh, uh, kind of site plan exercise where you're trying to create you know green belts and muses in between homes and you know some community uh, uh, interaction um, thoughtfully uh, you know just from a, a plan development standpoint so you can customize the deal a lot better from that standpoint. Um, so that's pretty much it. I, I, I don't want to go too long. I know probably have about 20, 20 minutes left. Uh, I think uh, Barrett and I thought it might be smart to open up for question and answers and, uh, and go from there. I'll kind of be quiet and thank you for listening through all that. And hopefully we learned a little bit and it made, made sense to everybody. Yeah, Andrew, that was excellent. Thanks so much for that really good overview of, of both the uh, Gray Star, as well as uh, the build for rent environment. We do have an, uh, a number of questions that have come in. Um, the first is uh, talk a little bit about the challenges of management uh, with the BFR product compared with multifamily, traditional multifamily apartments. Yeah, it's, it's totally, it's quite a bit different. You know, I'd say, you know, we manage, we've developed a lot of uh, a kind of back up a little bit. We've managed a lot of um, 65 and older apartment communities. We call it you know, our age restricted product. And we manage a lot of uh, traditional multifamily apartments and single family tends to kind of slot right in the middle of those. Uh, what you have on the age restricted side is you have uh, you know, absorption of probably six to eight leases a month. You know, the, the process is super thoughtful. You have multiple family members, uh, you know, kind of having to have that tour before, you know, they make the decision with mom and dad uh, in that, in that way. And so it's just, it's kind of like a, kind of like buying a timeshare. It's just a lot, a lot, lot longer of a, of a drawn out process. Um, contrast that with the multifamily side, 
you know, that's very quick. You know, they, there's a lot of turnover. They come, they sign the lease first day. And, you know, our absorption is anywhere between 18 to 24 units a month from a lease up standpoint in that space. So like I mentioned, single family rentals tend to kind of slot right in the middle there at around, um, you know, 10 to 12 uh, from an absorption standpoint. And, uh, you know, people, people want it. They, they're a little bit stickier of a product. They're going to be sticking around a little bit longer. Uh, they want to understand the schools in the area and, uh, and be a little bit more thoughtful about where they've put up roots. Uh, so I'd say from a high level, um, that's, that's kind of the, the main difference, notwithstanding kind of the design programmatic approach that we have in the overall product type in terms of, you know, design and how we develop them and then how we manage within that develop program. You know, the, we, we do a lot of, I should add, we do a lot of uh, kind of virtual tours in this space that's becoming more and more prevalent across the country, across product types. But, you know, to have someone kind of in a traditional sense sitting in a leasing office and waiting for a, uh, a customer to walk in the door just really isn't happening as much these days. So, you know, they have their, their phone, they have their, their app and they show up and there's a virtual tour laid out, tells them where to go, what to do and, and uh, what unit to go to. And it's all digitally managed where they can unlock the door themselves and go in there and there's cameras to manage security and whatnot. But um, we're, we're trying to really kind of um, be thoughtful about uh, our operation spend when it comes to this product type as well. And, and seeing that we can kind of get away with it a little bit more from that standpoint. Interesting. What's the typical lease term? Uh, compared with multifamily with apartments? Lease term, we, it's anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Um, similar to multifamily, we could probably get away with closer to the 18-month realm, but uh, definitely kind of longer lease terms on average. And, and again, those, those leases tend to be stickier. The retention is a lot higher uh, you know, whereas multifamily, you're probably in the 45% retention, you know, year over year, you're probably pushing up into the 60, you know, 65 retention in the single family and, uh, you know, people moving, you know, st store their stuff in the garage and it's just, it's harder to kind of, um, get up and move and people don't want to do it. Sure. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, uh, I'll just read it. It says it feels uh, a little like the narrative of the American dream is, is shifting, trading home ownership for more freedom and convenience. Do you feel this is true? I think that's a great question and something I've thought a lot about as well. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a generational uh, proposition as well. It's been said, and I won't speak for millennials, but, you know, millennials are more about experiences than, than things. And so the idea of, you know, staying in the same area your whole life and kind of you know working there and retiring there is is not is not happening as much anymore and there's a lot more kind of moving around and I, I think this provides that opportunity again I don't think it's replacing the American dream I think it's um it's provide we hope that it's providing another option um to those that need it uh, in, in, in maybe the short term or the long term, you know, there's, it just kind of depends on the preference. If this provides an opportunity for people to kind of get up and, and move across the country and be a little more flexible from a work, work live standpoint. And, uh, in, whereas before, maybe that wasn't as easy or you're taking a little bit more of a risk on, you know, one off, uh, single family renter that, you know, may pull the rug out, you know, as you've been living there for two years and uproot your family and whatnot. So it's just, I think it's, it's adding some optionality to the housing choices, uh, from that standpoint. But, um, and I think the two can very much coexist. You know, I think you talk to home builders and, uh, you know, groups like us, you know, there's a lot of master plans in there that they say they, they want build for rent in their master plan because it just provides okay. another housing option. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Uh, how do operating margins differ from tra tra traditional multifamily? You know, they're they're about the same, believe it or not. You know, the cost structure is interesting because these um, do the, the the lower density, they're, you know, there's the, the economics are underwriting them. It's, you know, you have to have uh, Kind of you have to approach it from more of a technology standpoint to get your operating margins lower. So I'd say on average they're a little bit lower to compensate for maybe the um, 
the fact that you you know you don't have that that bump in intensity that you get on the multifamily side. Um, so we're trying to keep our operating costs lower than the conventional multifamily um, to, to make deals work. And that's where technology is coming in and, and helping us do that, where we just have fewer FTE full-time employees on site. And, um, and that tends to balance out the economics if that makes sense, um, you know, from a, from a return standpoint. Um, and, yes. and it's, sense right okay great how how uh let's talk about returns a little bit uh, volatility as well as just the returns themselves compared with multifamily uh returns are uh, about the same and to be honest we're um in i should probably touch on cap rates at the same time cap rates are are very much in lockstep one to another there was a time early on in the bfr space and I, I speak more to purpose-built bfr rather than scattered site uh cap rates but purpose-built bfr cap rates were uh a little bit higher than multifamily in time as capital has kind of caught up with the product type and become more comfortable with that investment that's added more pressure to the market which has then lowered cap rates um commensurately uh, to the point where they're very much in, in, you know closer in line with in terms of kind of going in yields on this product type i mean these these days you have to be well north of a six going in yield i, I think from an apartment standpoint and a bfr standpoint to kind of get capital interested and kind of hit your um you know your your debt yields and whatnot with with banks which is probably a whole different discussion and an ever-evolving conversation you know yeah. Great. Let's uh, where our time is uh, getting closer and closer. Uh, talk a little bit about institutional investors and um, uh, data. I know data has always been a little bit difficult. You know, you're, uh, for institutional investors, this is a newer product. There's not a lot of data providers. Not it's a new area. Um, how do you go about working with institutional investors and helping them become comfortable with the product and uh, and the data in general? Um, That's a great question. And luckily, the supply and demand dynamics help us out a lot when, when you kind of look at the overhang of demand versus the supply in the market and just kind of what we believe is a tremendous opportunity. So that helps us maybe, if it makes sense, counteract some of the lack of um, data that exists in this product. Because you are, you're, you're kind of getting scrappy. Like I mentioned earlier, you're you're, uh, you're scraping Zillow, you're trying to kind of figure out where the shadow market is and, and you know, what the vintage of those homes are and maybe what you can rent a, a brand new purpose-built, professionally, you know, managed, fully monetized product for and, you know, what kind of premium can you get on top of that? Uh, so you're having to be a little bit scrappy. It's kind of early days multifamily when that data wasn't as readily available at your fingertips. I think there's a huge opportunity in this space um, to develop platforms around, um, you know, BFR like like you see data providers have done in an incredible way over the last 10, 11 years I've seen um, on the conventional side of, of multifamily. So I, I would generally say that, you know, it's, um, we're lucky that the opportunity feels big at this point, uh, but we can also get thoughtful about, you know, you look at a three or four bedroom apartments, fours are very hard to come by, but you look at a three bedroom apartment and, you know, what are those renting in the area? And then what would someone pay, you know, on top of that for a garage or for a yard or uh, for, um, you know, it, you know, the kind of the, what, what the apartment can't, can offer. And you can kind of, you can kind of go through a rent walk to kind of you know, back into a, a some something that makes sense. So you're kind of triangulating it from a number number of diff, different angles to uh, you know to get to what what you think that check rent can be. Um, That's great. Thank you. I, uh, one more is uh, has your fund? Do you have a fund on this and has been raising uh, recently for this product specifically? We do. We're fortunate to have a, a great relationship with CPPIB, um, Canadian um, Plan Pension um, Investment Board. Um, they manage all the Canadian you know, pension money uh, in that country, and they've committed, and this is all public knowledge, they've committed $800 um, million of unlevered capital um, to us in this platform, which is great in a 
a debt constrained market um, so that we can go kind of invest unlevered. Uh, so that's been a tremendous kind of boon and kind of shot in the arm for the platform as we work hand in hand with them to deploy that capital in a, in a thoughtful way um, in, in, in the in the strategy that I spoke about, you know, they, they're very fixed on three and four bedroom homes, kind of leaning into the space, kind of more of a longer term hold as millennials get, uh, um, you know, age. And uh, that's a product type. They don't feel like it, they're going to age out of any time soon. Um, so that fund has been been great for us. And we're continuing to kind of um, push that money out. We deployed quite a bit of it thus far and trying to be thoughtful uh, moving forward about, you know, how we spend that money. Okay, great. One last one, and then I want to invite you to, to share a nugget, nugget of wisdom or two with the students as we kind of wrap up here is that uh, talk a little bit about the competition. You know, uh, you know Ken Woolley, one of our alumni who's chairman of American Home for, uh, Homes for Rent, uh, chairman of the board, and uh, we have the REIT guy world and the private equity world. Uh, is there plenty of room for everyone? And uh, how do you view the competition, the lay of the land? I, I guess I, I tend to think so. I mean, I don't want to be uh, too altruistic about it. But um, again, I think the scattered side is it's a phenomenal model and it's um, it makes a ton of sense. I think we wish we could we had the infrastructure to um, invest in that space as well. Maybe someday we, we will as that develops. But that investment um, and I can't speak nearly um, as well about it as as perhaps others like like Ken Woolley, but um, you know that's that's a unique opportunity. I mean, those are great neighborhoods. You know, usually they're kind of closer in, and those provide a, a, again a different option for folks that maybe want to live a little closer in. Maybe they have a commute. Um, maybe maybe there's you know built-in amenities um, in those uh, what 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 are typically uh, more established communities. Uh, so I think there's something for people that maybe want that. And then there's um, there's opportunities for infill townhome purpose built developments to kind of work its way in maybe to that realm a little bit and provide, you know, albeit a more dense experience, but with, uh, you know, more of a, you know, purpose built um, type, um, you know, attribute to it. And then there's, you kind of go out kind of second ring and even third ring, and there's opportunities for um, a new housing type from a purpose-built standpoint out there, you know, with new schools popping up, maybe longer commute times, maybe that person is now working from home, they only need to come into the office one or two days a week. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope just saying that kind of spells out that, you know, the good news for all of us in the residential sector, notwithstanding these kind of these, you know, what, what may be, you know, a, a year or two of, uh, of of difficulty in terms of transaction volume and availability with debt and sticky inflation is that, you know, there's a housing shortage and, um, and it's incumbent upon all of us to help solve that problem. And it's going to take all of us, the for sale guys, the purpose built guys and the, the scattered site um, as well. So excellent. Excellent. This is a, a, a really exciting area. It's got to be fun to, to be participating in it. Uh, thank you, Andrew, so much. So let's end it with, uh, we have students, as you know, on the call, and I'd like to end it if uh, just uh, share a nugget of wisdom. If you were getting ready to graduate in the next um, month and a half or two and going into the workforce, I know you shared a little bit at the beginning, but uh, just one little uh, quick thought, and then we'll wrap things up. Yeah, I'll kind of end how I started, I, I guess, with a, a thought that's been in my mind a lot lately. Um, it's a quote I heard that, you know, you can live your life on your heels, you can live it flat footed, or you can live center of mass forward. And um, if I could borrow a little bit from, you know, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint theology, you know, we believe that Adam's fall was was fortunate. And we believe that it was it was downward, but it was also forward. And I'm grateful for kind of the courage that, you um, you know, if I, if you will, that you've had to kind of make that decision and put set man's foot upon progressions highway. And, um, and I think following in, in their footsteps, it's, um, I think that's how we're supposed to live. I think it's center mass forward. I, I don't think it's, it's, you know, being reckless or any, um, in any sort of way, but I think it's, uh, 
it's a it's a faith not fear approach. Uh, it's it's leaning in. It's um, it's you know sprinkling and in a heavy dose of of grit. You know, I, I've I've said recently that I'd rather hire someone that has that you know grit and that is self aware and and hardworking and conscientious um, than someone that maybe is off the charts kind of intelligent wise. Um, both are incredible attributes, but if I had to choose, um, I'd probably choose somebody that, uh, you know, has that center of mass forward and that's self-aware and that's hardworking and um, and wants to go the extra mile and is thinking kind of outside the box a little bit. I, I think that's important uh, for all of us to kind of remember. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's somewhat hard to teach um, but it's it's an important quality to have. So in keeping with kind of that spirit, I, I just, um, you know, I know life is difficult and we're all dealing with um, our, our various challenges, but I know that um, as we, we lean into life and we exhibit faith, not fear, that, uh, you know, the downward portion, you know, obviously there's, there's, that's, that's been kind of, that's been solved for, you know, and in, in the form of the condescension of Christ and and his redeeming love to kind of lift us out, to con ascend with us um, back to the presence of our Heavenly Father and, and, you know, through growth and development in life. The forward is is on us, you know, to, to lean forward with faith and, and to push forward. So I would just say um, be confident in, uh, in your abilities and um, be aware of um, of uh, the, you know, the, the, the importance it is to kind of work hard and, um, and to do your best. And I know that as these students do that, and I think, look, I think that's the cloth that most BYU students are cut out of. And we're fortunate to, to understand that theology and, um, and know that as we, um, you know, life's not gonna be easy, but as we lean forward, um, center mass forward that uh, Heavenly Father will will bless our path um, moving forward. He won't make it easy by any means, by any stretch, but he will um, he will help us in that way and, and help us navigate um, the difficulties of life. So I'll be in with that. Thank you, Andrew, so much. And for all of you who have been on the call today, thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to, to being with you again on April 20th where uh, when Brandon Blazer will teach us a little bit about uh, urban development. Have a great uh, day and take care and we'll see you on the 20th.